Good, e good evening, everybody. It is 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday, September 21st, 2021, and this regular meeting of the Sandpoint Planning and Zoning Commission is now called to order. For the record, I am Chairman Jason Welker, presiding in Council Chambers at Sandpoint City Hall, 1123 West Lake Street in Sandpoint, Idaho. Also present are Commissioners John Hastings via Zoom, Kate Wiesman via Zoom, Tom Riggs via Zoom, <laughs> in the Chambers, Slate Camp, Forrest Shuck, and Most Uncle. First is an announcement. The public hearing on city application PZC21-0001, PZC which is a request for zone change and comprehensive planned, planned land use map amendment that was scheduled for this meeting has been postponed to a special meeting scheduled for 5.30 p.m. next Wednesday, September 28th. Are there any other general announcements or reports from the commissioners or from staff? Tom, John, or Kate? None here. Okay. Nothing here. I actually would like to start with a announcement, a um, an observation. Um, I'd like to actually express my disappointment in uh, last week's city council meeting, during which the city council heard the preliminary plat application for Boyer Meadows, which on August seventeenth, we as a commission approved with conditions. One of those conditions was for a ten foot pedestrian and cyclist pathway connecting the cul-de-sac to, to North Boyer. Um, that condition was included based on language from our comprehensive plan, which discourages cul-de-sacs, but says where cul-de-sacs are allowed, they must provide for continuous non-motorized connections between streets. Uh, that was a pretty important condition to us as a commission. And during the um, presentation by Mr. Mort of Monogram Homes to the city council, uh, he implied that the $60,000 approximate cost of that infrastructure investment would be passed on to the buyers of those homes, raising the price of each of the 20 homes by $3,000. Um, I just wanted to point out that uh, following his presentation to this commission on August 17th, I asked Mr. Mort very openly um, whether these were market priced homes or whether they were workforce housing, which is a term that he used several times in his presentation to us. And uh, after asking us after saying, well, it depends on whose workforce you're talking about, uh, Mr. Mort ultimately confirmed that these would be market priced homes. So I was uh, pretty upset when uh, Mr. Mort implied that somehow this $3,000 cost per home would be passed on to consumers. Because as anybody knows, um, market price means that those homes will sell for the highest price the market can bear. And the cost of infrastructure required by our comp plan uh, does not need to be passed on to buyers of homes and uh, ultimately would be and should be borne by the developers themselves. So to see city council remove that pathway, which is required by our comp plan was a real disappointment to me. And in response, I followed uh, that meeting with an email to our planning staff, asking the staff to work up some language in title 10, which is the subdivision ordinance of our city code that would codify the requirement for multimodal connectivity when cul-de-sacs are allowed in future subdivisions. Um, I'm aware that language in our comp plan is more visionary and not necessarily legally binding. So I think this particular um, requirement should be legally binding so that future developers would be required to make that investment, which is clearly for the betterment of the community, for the public. So I just wanted to make that announcement and I look forward to hopefully deliberating a amendment in the near future to Title 10 that would codify the requirement from our <coughs> company. And that's it for me. So uh, we'll move on to item four in the agenda tonight. That's meeting minutes approval. Uh, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the September 7th, 2021 meeting. So moved. Anybody would like to second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, the motion passes and those minutes are approved. Okay, we'll now move on to old business. Our last, at our last meeting on September 7th, the public hearing was held. And after the public hearing was closed, the commission began deliberation to consider part one of the proposed Title IX zoning amendments pertaining to the Sand Creek setback and constructing along Sand Creek. On this matter, the commission postponed their deliberations and recommendation to city council to this evening's meeting in order to discuss with staff in more detail the proposed changes to the zoning ordinance, 
including consideration of the requirement of the conditional use permit process within the 25 foot setback and language to enhance water quality. I will now yield the floor to city staff for their updates and presentations for both parts one and two. Is that you, Darren? It is, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, and just to clarify, we um, we are will be opening the public hearing on both of these items again this evening. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to attempt to share my screen and hope nothing bad happens. And are you seeing my uh, PowerPoint? We are. Yes. yes. All right. Uh, well, good evening, commissioners, and thank you for having me. Um, as you know, uh, my colleagues, um, Tess Cooper and Maeve nevins Lavar uh, gave this presentation um, at your last meeting. And just due to the nature of the amendments and, and the implementation thereof, um, I was tagged to uh, bring forward these amendments for you. So I'll do that. And if you have questions as I'm going through, as always, um, you'd be welcome to uh, ask those and we'll deal with them as they come up. So just by way of a quick recap, you'll recall that our last hearing on September 7th, that the commission tabled this item and asked for revisions to be considered, specifically um, the addition of, a, addition of a provision requiring the enhancement of water quality as a condition of approval when future land use is regulated by the ordinance, as well as a requirement uh, for a conditional use for all structures within 25 feet of the artificial high water mark. We did not hear or act on part two, actually that should be, should say part B, um, that, which is how it's written in the ordinance. Uh, and we will do that this evening. And so again, we will be reopening the public hearing. Um, again, by way of a reminder, um, the current code revisions that are uh, in front of the commission are contemplated only in the commercial zoning designations fronting Sand Creek. Um, in its entirety, um, that is shown here on this uh, GIS snapshot for you, um, which just extends uh, north uh, uh, ways um, of the, uh, the railroad trestle bridge that you see coming across here. Commercial zoning along the waterfront and down to the bypass. The commission will um, be very familiar with the setback from Sand Creek as it exists today. Um, and one of the issues that, um, one of the primary issues that we have is the use of the word structures along Sand Creek, which is uh, um, far too broad and in our estimation should have uh, said buildings. Um, in addition, it does leave some um, important considerations out and we're going to get into those just a, a little bit more um, here under the justification slide. So why are we doing this? Again, this is a recap. We went through this in some detail last time, but um, basically the ordinance as written prohibits all structures within 25 feet of the full summertime pool elevation of 2062, um, which is more properly labeled the artificial high water mark. After consultation with the Department of Water Resources and Department of Lands, um, they make a, a very clear distinction between artificial high water and ordinary high water, which is also known as the winter pool elevation. Um, the current ordinance also allows exceptions only for uncovered porches and pervious decks and five foot improved pervious sidewalks. Um, in other words, the, the ordinance as it's now written says your building must be set back 25 feet from that elevation of 2062. However, if you'd like to do an uncovered porch or a pervious deck, you can extend 15 feet into um, that 25 foot setback. Um, we have eliminated that exception. And so at least in that regard, this ordinance um, that's before you this evening is more stringent um, than the ordinance that's on the books right now. The implications of these, um, um, I guess I'll call them oversights, so that's probably not a great, great word, but the implications um, of this language is that it um, in no way recognizes the jurisdiction and authority of the federal agencies, that is the EP, um, the Environmental Protection Agency, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, all who have a, a part in issuance of 404 permits um, under the Clean Water Act. And so essentially anything um, that takes place within Sand Creek 
that is below the artificial high water mark does require a 404 permit, which is issued through the Army Corps of Engineers. Our uh, existing ordinance is completely silent on that point. Um, it also does not recognize the jurisdiction and authority of the state of Idaho, specifically the Department of Environmental Quality and the Department of Lands, which does claim jurisdiction for any land that is between the artificial high water and ordinary high water marks. And then it does not importantly distinguish between buildings and structures. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, and it would therefore prohibit water dependent uses such as boardwalks, docks, and marinas. And, it, and even more importantly, it would prohibit the implementation of stormwater treatment structures as contemplated both by the uh, Parks and Recreation Master Plan and the Sandpoint Stormwater Plan and was really the driving reason for why the city bought the property um, down in Farmers Landing to correct, um, to construct a uh, best management practice stormwater facility and improve what we have today. And then finally, it would prohibit implementation of the Parks and Rec Master Plan. So I, I'm not sure that I need to um, beat this horse, horse to death, but as this commission knows, um, in the business of public policy, we are always in um, the situation of balancing competing um, public goods, if you will. Um, in this instance, we have pressures on the waterfront for economic development and recreation demands, as well as private property rights. Um, but at the same time, we must consider federal and state regulations. Um, we'd like to provide public access as well. And we also obviously want to maintain water quality and environmental um, considerations. And so it's never one or the other. It's always trying to get to policy that gets us the most public good um, for the least cost, if you will. Um, just by way of a reminder, um, the, the area north of Bridge Street is the Farman's Landing area, and that's the area where the city has intended to implement not only some new stormwater management practices, but also um, a public plaza um, that was fully vetted through the public process and adopted by the city council um, toward the end of last year in 2020. So I would, at this point, I'd like to dive into the ordinance um, specifically um, as it was written and then as the commission um, did request that it be modified. Um, this might be a good opportunity for me to just take a, a quick pause and ask the commission if there were any questions or comments up to this point in the presentation. Are there any questions for Darren? I have one. I have a question. And uh, you said some of the shortcomings with the current code um, was that it didn't acknowledge federal or state um, uh, jurisdiction. Um, do they have any jurisdiction beyond that uh, artificial high water mark, or is it, or does their jurisdiction end at the artificial high water mark? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, I'll, I'll get the language wrong if I try to quote it uh, verbatim, but essentially if you are, if a project is impacting waters of the U.S. either with uh, fill um, or dredging, they're required to get a 404 permit. Um, so just by way of, a, of an example that you'd be familiar with, um, recently when the Arlo's building was deconstructed and when it um, goes to be reconstructed, both of those things would require a 404 permit through the Army Corps. Darren, can I ask a follow-up to that? So you bet. If, it, if that answered Commissioner Hastings' questions, I'm... Um, the, the Arlo's building, it's, it's fairly obvious why, because that is beyond the artificial high water mark with pilings out in the creek. Um, another more recent example, or should say a recent example, would be, I would be curious, did the SPUDS renovation, which built a retaining wall right around what appears to be artificial high water mark, did that require a permit from the, the feds or the state authorities. Mr. Chairman, I'm afraid I'm, I'm not prepared to answer that question because I, I'm simply uh, not privy to the history. Perhaps one of my colleagues there in the room would. Um, I'm guessing Amanda has the answer for us. 
Well, I hope so. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the question. Um, while we're not in a position to discuss specific properties this evening, especially potential non-conformance um, of buildings and or parcels, um, I am happy to have a general conversation about permitting. Um, so yes, to construct a bulkhead wall um, in and below the artificial high water, yes, you would need to engage the Idaho Department of Lands for proper permitting. Additionally, above artificial high, back to Chairman Hastings' question, um, we have other regulations, um, as Darren mentioned, such as FEMA regulations that apply outside of the heart of artificial high water mark, as well as overarching um, Department of Environmental Quality regulations and other overlaps in that regard. Thank you. You're welcome. Did that answer your question, John? Yes. Yep, good. Are there any other questions for Darren before we continue? Uh, I have a couple of questions on the specific language in the draft ordinance. Uh, I think he's going to get to that first. Can we hold off on those, Tom? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's about to present that for us. Okay. Very prescient, Commissioner. We're going to move right into the ordinance right now. So the, um, the ordinance as amended, um, this is the front part of the ordinance, um, starting with provision A there, the applicability. Commissioner will notice that uh, there were no um, um, edits requested for this particular section. And so this reads just how you saw it last week. Um, moving on to the next provisions. There was um, some discussion about whether or not um, one of the conditions should require enhancements to water quality. That's why we have this highlighted for you, just simply to say that the, um, that already was accounted for within the language as drafted and as presented to the PNC. And so the improvements to the water quality, in addition to um, the orientation of the buildings and preservation of public access and enhancements of aesthetics, um, all of those things will be considerations um, for future land uses. Um, the meat and potatoes of what the commission had requested as far as changes are here, um, because of how uh, the, um, you know, the uh, edit function works within Word, it does look a little bit clunky. But what we're saying here is that functionally dependent water uses and structures, including but not limited to bridges, boardwalks, stormwater systems, plazas, walkways, access stairways and features, marge facilities, stream, stream stabilization and art features may be constructed above or below the applicable high water mark subject to a conditional use permit, issuance of a conditional use permit, notification and approval of all applicable state and federal regulations and compliance with the Sandpoint Storm Water Ordinance. I did rejigger the language a bit here to um, read a little bit more cleanly in, in code language, if you will. Um, but I believe this does get to the commission's concern um, over um, whether or not those water dependent uses um, should be required to get a conditional use permit regardless of their location relative to the um, artificial high water or ordinary high water. I would point out here for you that um, this is um, considerably more restrictive than um, what is in the ordinance now. Um, all buildings, um, as is in the ordinance now, are required to set back 25 feet, full stop. That has not changed. Um, that's still the requirement here. We're talking in this instance only about water dependent uses, such as the docks and um, boardwalks, and importantly, the stormwater structures that the city has intended to build. And then the last part of the ordinance, these provisions, which are important, also have not changed. This is where we um, are required to notify applicable federal and state agencies. Um, there's a bit of redundancy here. Those, those uh, requirements are in place whether or not the city does that. But this uh, gets to a, a question of enforcement and it does give us a, a sort of a check and balance on the process that the uh, applicable agencies are involved when the, the projects are going through. So I think that's a good spot again for me to pause and we can talk about the amended language. 
um, and hopefully this does meet the intent of the, the commission as requested at the previous hearing. Darren, can you back up a slide, please, to the amended language? Thank you. Tom, did you want to start off with your questions? Sure. Um, Darren, the first question relates to the subsection D, all buildings within the downtown waterfront shall be reviewed, et cetera. I, my question has to do with how, how does that section get implemented? Is the intent that up front, the city's gonna go out and review all buildings or is this something that would happen only when there's a building permit and a building is newly being constructed? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, that is a, a very good question. And the answer is that um, it would kick in through the building permit and or site plan review process. We will not be auditing the existing buildings along the waterfront. Um, this is for all new construction going forward. Okay, um, well, just, just, just uh, <clears throat> I guess an editorial comment on my part is, I think, it, I think that language could be made a little clearer to just clearly say that that only applies to uh, new construction. And, and it also, it, it's not that clear, well, what happens if the, the review indicates that mm, there's no enhancement of aesthetics or public access preservation is not great. I wonder if it should affirmatively say that those are requirements that need to be met for the approval of new projects. Question on my half, on my behalf. And then, then moving on to the next one, um, that would be E that starts with the, the phrase functionally dependent water uses and structures including but not limited to, et cetera, et cetera. I think that that phrase functionally dependent water uses, I think is kind of vague and I'm wondering if it's defined or should be defined somewhere in this code. Strikes me, I, th I think a, a definition of that term would be useful. Those are my present questions or comments. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, thank you for those. Um, not, uh, those are uh, excellent comments and um, certainly, especially with regard to the last one, um, we could certainly define functionally dependent water uses. You'll note that uh, previously we, um, we defined those as defined by FEMA. Um, and in my reading of the, the FEMA regulations, I was really um, relegated to um, two very specific waterfront type uses for um, large port facilities and really wasn't applicable to what we were doing. So the thinking here was that by saying um, functionally dependent water uses, you know, those that are dependent on the, the water, such as the bridges and boardwalks and stormwater systems um, was, was adequate for definition, but we certainly could add a definition um, if the commission were to direct us to do that. Thanks. I, I have a question about that as well, Darren. I noticed that the word structure is removed from E. I believe two weeks ago, we requested that all structures built within the 25 foot setback would require a CUP. Um, it seems to have been narrowed to structures that I should say, that generally uh, structures has been removed and replaced with uh, structures that are functionally dependent water uses. Um, I, I also have questions about that term and I wonder if something like just a, a, a private patio is a functionally dependent water use. It doesn't necessarily seem to me like a patio for, you know, restaurant diners to sit on is necessarily dependent on the water. Um, does this, does item E require that all structures or just those that are dependent on the water require a CUP? Is there any way for a, a developer to 
build a structure within 25 feet without first acquiring, obtaining a CUP from the city? Does the language narrow it too much by saying functionally dependent water uses? Uh, Mr. Chairman, again, fair question. Um, I think I would point us back to um, the, first of all, and this gets into a little bit of our discussion coming up later on the um, changes to the definitions where we define, um, redefine buildings and structures. And I can hop over that real quick if you'd like. But um, basically what we're saying here that all buildings are set back 25 feet. So a building in this definition would include um, a, a porch or a deck, you know, anything that's part of the structure. Um, in this instance, I don't believe that flat work um, would be um, considered part of the building. That would be considered uh, outside of the building. And again, to your point, I, um, I think I would have a hard time um, classifying uh, flat work that is a patio on private property um, as a functionally dependent water use. Here we were really thinking of structures or um, such as you know, the ones that we've listed. So I'm a little unclear there. A, a, a patio for a, let's say a condo unit or a restaurant that extends to the high water mark or beyond the high water mark, uh, that's not uh, dependent on the water, would or would not require a CUP? Well, certainly you wouldn't be able to construct it beyond the artificial high water. Um, but I, um, in my estimation, the addition of flat work would be allowed within the um, 25 foot setback. Without the CUP? Correct. So to be clear, a patio, could be constructed and you, you say, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the term flat work. Flat work, you, re you refer to a flat concrete patio. Correct. Correct. Uh, with the current language as, as proposed tonight, I should say, would be allowed to be constructed within the 25 foot setback with no conditional use permit because it's not a functionally dependent uh, water use. So this language is really only addressing structures that are dependent on the water those would require CUPs, but all other structures would not require CUP. So a developer could build a building up to 25 feet and then beyond that, a structure right up to the artificial high water mark. Mr. Chairman. I, I, I feel like that's what he's saying. Yes. It says functionally dependent water uses and structures. So it's including both. So not, not structures that are functionally water dependent. Okay. So is Darren, is what Darren's saying not correct then? I just want to be clear on what the language itself would say. Gotcha. So this could mean functionally dependent water uses and all other structures. Okay. Um, so is it not correct then that a, a developer could build a, a patio without a CUP? I'll let Darren answer the technical what ifs. I just wanted to be really clear on the language. It says and structure, okay. structures. Okay. I think I was reading it as structures that are functionally dependent water uses. It said functionally dependent water use structures. Gotcha. Okay. So Darren, do you want to do you want to clarify that? Am, am I understanding you correct that a patio that's because now I now based on what Fond is saying, I I would assume it means all structures, well, and, and, including functionally dependent water uses, would require a CUP. I guess Ms. to relate that response also with what you've already heard from. Amanda regarding the cross jurisdictional review sure. in yeah. that 25 foot setback. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, we're not getting Fonda's audio very well. I'm not uh, I'm not sure the where the microphone is, but I'm I'm not able to hear what she's saying. So Darren, I'll I'll just repeat what I was pointing out is that the language says functionally dependent water uses and structures. Yes. Structures was not eliminated, nor was structures qualified by the word functionally dependent water uses. So that was a point of clarification regarding the language. The implication of that, I just went on to add, in addition to what your response might be, we can't gloss over Amanda's explanation of the cross-jurisdictional requirements for review by other governmental agencies within that same 25-foot setback. And those are excellent comments, Fonda and Mr. Chairman. I apologize. I believe I did. Um, 
misspeak and lost my train of thought there, but that was the intent that functionally dependent water uses and structures. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll we go back to the definition of structures here in just a little bit, so you'll see how broad yeah, that is. That's next on our agenda is definitions. Yeah, go ahead, Mo. Um, so it, it says structures including but not limited to, and then it lists several things, and it even says the word features, which I could be just about anything, couldn't it? Art features and art features. Um, I mean. I feel like it is including just about any anything that would be a change to what is there now. So I don't know if we, if it's helpful to list bridges, boardwalks, and all and all and et cetera. When maybe it could just say something shorter that was like any significant change to the the landscape. Or um, I mean, I, I think the structure part is definitely. Uh, something that needs to be in there and I think the but not limited to should be in there but it could it could be kind of because I feel like if you write down bridges and boardwalks and that kind of thing you're kind of cornering yourself into you know here's the things that we're referring to but then maybe a a small walkway or or something like that maybe it doesn't quite fit into some of that depending on which commission or which city council is looking at it um I would be in favor of that being shortened up to just to be a little more pointed of what are we really getting at? You know, what are we really okay with and what are we not okay with without the with or with the conditional use permit? Thanks. Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner, what we were trying to get at there was that we were exactly trying to be specific and say what we're really talking about here is functionally dependent water uses and not buildings. And so it is a bit of belt and suspender with our provision uh, C, which says buildings will be set back 25 feet, <clears throat> full stop. <laughs> um, but then if you want, you know, there are certain things that make sense because you can't have a dock without it being down on the water. And so that that's exactly what we were trying to do is take some of the guesswork out of it. Taken. Are there other questions for Darren from the commission? Yeah. I do have one. Okay, Slate and then Kate. So earlier in your presentation, you did say you redlined the 15 feet, the 15 foot pervious encroachment into the 25, correct? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, yes, the, the old definition was struck in its entirety. I missed last week's or two weeks ago meeting and was, where did it go? Functionally, what was the term? Functionally dependent uses. Yeah, functionally dependent uses. Water dependent. defined. Functionally dependent. Water uses. Water uses. Well, let's look at what we were presented with last week. It's, it's striked out now, yes. Uh, the previous language was all structures except buildings uh, and other functionally dependent water uses may be constructed above or below. It was as defined by FEMA, which mm -hmm. was very broad. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, Slade? No, not at this time. Kate? Yeah, Darren, I have a question with respect to... Um, the uses and limitations of CUPs. I'm concerned that when we write zoning code, we, we give rights to the owners of properties within that zone to build the things that it, the zoning code says they may build. And with CUPs, I, I, I just don't, do, this, do CUPs give us as a commission or the city council an absolute right to deny uh, a use? Uh, and to use my ridiculous example from two weeks ago, should someone build a, 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 a race car track in this setback that meets all the other requirements, but 
as a community, we just don't really want it there. Can we deny them a CUP or if they meet the requirements, do we have to give them one? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, um, as usual, you're two steps ahead of me. And so I went ahead and advanced to my next slide where I was going to talk about conditional usage. Um, you're you're um, exactly right on one point, and that is that um, the structure of the Sandpoint Code, specifically the commercial designations, um, is not the traditional way of writing land uses. So I, I need to give you a bit of a long answer here, um, and so forgive me for that. But the long answer is this, that within um, a zoning designation, such as a commercial zoning designation, the typical way that you would write that would be to create three different kinds of land uses. That is principal permitted uses. Those are the uses that the zone is set up and intended to accommodate. And so in a commercial zone, that's typically retail, um, office uses. Sometimes it includes some limited residential in some form or another. Um, and certain other uses, you're familiar with the land use table in your code and the range of uses that are allowed such as parking structures and other things. So those are your principal permitted uses. The second category is accessory uses. And those are uses that are subordinate and ancillary to a principal permitted use. And so in a residential zone, for instance, if a principal permitted use is a single family dwelling, um, an accessory use would be a detached garage, for instance, um, or a shed perhaps. Um, in a commercial zone, it could also be a, a shed or uh, some sort of, uh, say, a canopy structure um, over um, a outdoor break area. That would be considered an accessory use to the principal permitted. And then the third category is conditional uses. And those are uses that are um, perhaps compatible with the other land uses that are allowed in the zone. Um, but they may have objectionable characteristics to the operation of the land use um, that necessitate the placement of conditions on the operation of that use, such that they're more compatible with surrounding land uses and don't have an adverse impact on its uses. And so if we were rewriting your ordinance today in entirety, we would um, create a large land use table for you for each one of your zoning designations that laid out specifically what the principal permitted uses are, the accessory uses, and the conditional uses. Um, that's not the ordinance we have, however, and so we're working within the structure um, that we have um, to take care of this um, you know, somewhat urgent need um, because of the, um, what's lacking in the ordinance right now. There are other instances in your code where it does um, um, specify that a land use is, in, um, is a conditional use, um, but it's buried within the text of the ordinance, which is, you know, a, not a best practice, but a discussion for another time. So in working with the, the current ordinance, we did propose the, the use of the conditional use permit. Um, and in answer to the other part of your question, um, the uses that are allowed within the zone, um, specifically conditional uses, are a discretionary act on the part of the commission. However, if you're able to condition that, that land use um, such that it won't have an adverse impact, then you are obligated to approve that land use. It is just, it's not saying that just if you don't like a particular land use or landowner, if it's a conditional use, um, that it could be denied. It would have to be denied for very specific reasons, and that is that it had adverse impacts on surrounding properties that couldn't be mitigated with the use of conditions. Could an adverse impact on water quality also be considered an adverse condition? It could. Um, let me ask the question another way, just because I, I, I remember those tables of uses. Uh, we put an immense amount of work into writing them years ago. And I, there, if we grant use through this ordinance of structures of some sort in the 25 foot setback, are we then granting landowners by right, the right to build in that setback, whatever else, whatever it says in that, those tables is allowed for commercial A in the Southern end and, and commercial B in the North end? Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner, the answer is no. 
um, because most all of those land uses that we're describing take place within a building. And so buildings are required to be set back 25 feet, hard stop. Okay. So it, that's what you meant by uh, those tables in effect do not apply here. Well, each one of those land uses that are included in the commercial zone are, are allowed, provided that you can meet the other requirements of the ordinance. In this case, we're being very specific about water dependent uses, saying that those would be allowed if the commission approves a conditional use permit and if the um, federal and state agencies issue their permits and um, it complies with the provisions of the Sandpoint Stormwater Ordinance. And for us to, for us to deny a condition, conditional use permit, we would have to have a reason uh, suggesting that that we want to deny use because the use, the applicant is wanting to do something that will be harmful to neighbors or harmful to water quality. Is that correct? That's correct, Commissioner. Otherwise, the landowner has a right to use that land in the setback as they see fit within the definition of this ordinance. Is that correct? Um, subject to the approval of the commission and the, and the other regulatory agencies. I mean, that's true of any use in any zone. Okay. And so not to put too fine a point on it, but just to finish out the discussion of conditional use permits. Um, again, they should be designated by zoning district um, in this case, we're more or less doing that, just not in a format that, that we would probably choose if we were starting over. Um, we are look, would be looking at land uses with objectionable characteristics that we just have concerns might have impacts on surrounding properties. And so therefore we condition those land uses to uh, ensure compatibility. Um, and then this is getting to the point of what Commissioner Huseman is uh, speaking to, which is, the conditions that we place must be specific to the conduct of the land use, you know, and related to the plans and ordinances that we have on the books as a city. We can't make up regulations out of whole cloth that um, don't exist anywhere within our, our plans or statutes within the city. And it's important to note that, that conditional uses are not use variances. They don't allow a land use that would otherwise be prohibited, such as a racetrack. Um, and uh, it's not a method for denying otherwise, you know, allowed land uses. So that also gets to your point, Commissioner, of um, you know what you would, um, what findings you would need to make to deny an application for a conditional use. And then you see some examples of conditions of approval that you know might be placed on something like a dock, um, and what you might not do is just. Uh, you know, decide that uh, a landowner would have to dedicate um, public access through their property. However, we have something already. I don't know why I can't find it. Uh, that says something about public access as, what did we say about public access? It's definitely a goal of the plan. Right. And so it's definitely conversations that we have with every applicant. It's just, um, it's difficult to, um, to require when uh, there aren't conditions that, uh, you know, necessitate it. So that gets back then to uh, Commissioner Riggs' concern about the language, and I share it. Main, main, maintaining or improving water quality and providing public access are considerations. And uh, if a landowner decides that she would like to build a private deck or dock or water treatment area in her 25 foot easement, it appears that she would have the right to do that under this ordinance. Is that correct? Um, well, subject to the approval and conditions of the commission and the other regulatory agencies. 
So, but when you say subject to our approval and our conditions, it sounds like we don't have a right to disapprove if she, the land she's developing meets the requirements of the, of the, the code we're working on here. Well, I mean, this it's is not a method for denying otherwise allowed land uses. So what we are writing here is what a person can do by right and public assets and water quality are considerations, but yeah, it doesn't sound like real strong language to me that, that gives us a strong reason to deny a CUP, for example, uh, if those considerations are not met. Commissioner, I'm not, I'm not sure that that isn't a problem that we have already. This is not a new problem with this ordinance. This is always the balancing act that we're uh, trying to walk um, when we're trying to ask for public improvements on, on private property. Um, perhaps uh, Fonda would like to jump in here and put a finer point on this. That'd be great. I, I think part of the process that is being skipped over is the pre-application process that these applicants engage with planning staff. So the language you are talking about that Commissioner Houston, where you feel like it might not be strong enough, is what gives the planning staff the ability in those pre-application meetings to suggest to these applicants that they put forth an application for a conditional use permit that would be palatable to you. I mean, staff doesn't want to bring in an application that they don't feel is going to be palatable to the commission. So I think the process that's sort of being overlooked in the conversation about code, because it just naturally happens, we go right to the end result, is all of the language that's necessary in code to give the staff the, the ability to have meaningful conversations with these applicants about putting forth an actual application that's going to be palatable to the public and palatable to you. But we don't have the power to deny something that is unpalatable should an applicant wish to uh, to build something unpalatable. Sure, sure. And we would have to rewrite the code to do that. And then would we be subject to a takings claim? Sure, you have the ability to make a finding as to all the reasons why it's unpalatable to you and make a recommendation for denial or deny, depending on what type of applications in front of you, but you're correct. There, there's always exposure to a takings claim. And we can't forget that one of your responsibilities as commissioners under the Local Land Use Planning Act, as Darren talked about in the beginning, is to balance these two sides of the equation, which one of those is private property rights as well. So there is a balancing act between protecting the, the public, the environment, and the private property rights. And it's a difficult balancing act, but you could make a motion and findings to deny a CUP with the risk. You, you take that risk every time you make findings. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions for Darren? Forrest. Darren, oh, by the way, I, I have a quick announcement here. Forrest, happy birthday. Ah. <laughs> I promised I would say that tonight. So. Go ahead, I have a question. I have a question unrelated to the proceedings. Can you hear me? John? Yeah, Forrest was just about to ask a question. Can we come back to you in just a moment? Yeah. Or do you have a, you, you have well, a question about the proceedings? I, it was just that I had gotten kicked off and okay. um, it, and I'm back on now with my phone, but I'm not really seeing what's going on. But I was just curious if you are still hearing me. We can hear you now. We wondered where you went there for a few minutes. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, Forrest, go ahead. In general terms, would these changes expand, restrict, or have little impact on public access to Sand Creek in this, this zone? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, I, that um, is a good question. And I'm, in my estimation, this actually gives us more leverage in working with the applicants than what we have in the ordinance right now. Um, 
you know, the, the, we have plans um, on the books that really promote public access to the water. That is the plan of the city to have um, the Sandpoint waterfront be the front yard of the city. Um, there's much discussion about that in the Parks and Recreation Master Plan about um, cities in general and in Sandpoint specifically turning its back to the water. And one of the, the main goals of the plan is to embrace the waterfront and make it the front yard of the city. And so um, we're on record as, as a city wanting those kind of amenities. And I believe that with the language that's in this ordinance, it gives us the power to make that a consideration as you consider um, these various applications. Thank you. Any final questions for Darren at this time? One more. Go ahead. Public access is only subject to the property the city owns in this, correct? Mr. Chairman, we um, there is no requirement to provide public access um, codified either now or in the proposed ordinance. Okay. But you have a you have a parks master plan that right. speaks to accessibility to the waterfront by the public. Yes. Owned by the city. Uh, yes. And correct me if I'm wrong, but there have been negotiations with developers in the past that have included requirements or the expectation of public easements and access. I'm thinking of the first and bridge street development as an example. I don't know if that's finalized, but there, there have been opportunities for the city staff to work with developers to assure some degree of public access through private property or on private property. So As private property owners bring applications for permits or projects, there's always an opportunity to talk about accessibility at that stage. Mm -hmm. But it, I mean, I think we all understand that private property, there's no requirement or we can't require public access, correct? Right. Yeah. So, Progress. Okay. okay. Um, I think we'll have more opportunities to ask questions of staff after the public hearing. Um, but at this time, I will move that we now reopen the public hearing to address the amended proposed ordinance in part two of the proposed amendments. Have we, Fonda, do we need to hear part two before we open, reopen the public hearing? Have I gotten ahead of us here with, with regards to definitions? So for clarity purposes for process. Oh, so I think, yeah, I think Darren has more to present before we move on right. to public hearing. And we posted for one public right. hearing for both, right. both parts. Right. So. Darren, do you want to finish the presentation with regards to part two, and then we'll open the public hearing? Absolutely. Yeah, so go ahead, Darren. We'll now listen to part two of the uh, proposed amendments to city code. Part two, otherwise known as ordinance part B, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is a much less complicated um, and much more straightforward package of amendments. Um, I would very much characterize these as uh, cleanups to the existing ordinance things that we've noted um, were problems, not necessarily just with the, um, the amendment we just heard, although a couple of these are definitely related, um, but this is more broad. And so I'm just going to walk you through those changes very quickly. Um, and if you had questions, again, please feel free to um, interrupt me while I'm going through this. Um, so the first uh, set of changes deals with definitions. And what we were doing here um, was deleting the definition of building and replacing with a new definition of building, which is consistent with the International Building Code. Although it's not mandatory, it's just a good practice um, for your zoning ordinance and your building code to match up in terms of definitions wherever possible. It's not always possible, but certainly in terms of uh, defining a building and a structure, it, it is. And so that's what we're doing here with regard to building. Um, with regard to the building line, um, we found that to be too general and problematic because the old definition, because it only referred to the uh, front building line. And so we expanded the definition to just say the building line is, is everywhere the building exists, basically. Are there any questions about those particular changes of the verbiage we've uh, selected there? Okay. 
Um, the next set um, deal with the definition of setback. Uh, believe it or not, setback was not defined in the ordinance. And so we thought while we were at it, we'd go ahead and include that definition, definition in here. Um, we eliminated the old definition of structure um, and paired it back quite a bit, made it quite a lot more general, again, in an effort uh, to have consistency with the International Building Code. And then the more interesting of all of these, then the last one is the elimination of the term tourist home. Um, and this is because with the adoption of your short-term rental ordinance, um, this, this definition became superfluous. Um, it existed here um, in the definitions and it existed as a land use in the mixed use um, residential zone, the MUR zone. And so we eliminated the definition and we also eliminated the land use in the MUR section of the code. And now what you previously knew as a tourist home is defined as a, a short-term rental and regulated um, by a wholly separate ordinance within the Sandpoint City Code. This is, um, in my estimation, uh, probably the, the most important ordinance um, amendment we have going on this second package. And that is the addition of um, some standards to multifamily zoning in the commercial C zone. Um, you'll see here on your land use table that multifamily residential is an allowed use um, in the commercial C zone. Um, but all it says is yes, it's allowed. And in the commercial zoning designations, we don't have um, regulations that are particular to multifamily structures. And so that leaves staff and applicants both in a vulnerable position um, because we, when we try to require things um, that aren't in the code, um, it's problematic when we get pushback. And similarly for applicants who really just wanna design a project that they can get approved, they don't know what the standards are. And so in this case, we, all we did was add a footnote number nine um, to that yes, which you can barely see there. And the footnote number nine simply says that multifamily developments in the CC zone are subject to the design and dimensional standards of 9423, which is the, the standards of the RM zone, the multifamily zone for multifamily projects. Um, we've had a couple of projects that um, are, um, ready to come in and we're hoping to get this amendment adopted um, very quickly so we can apply those regulations. So that brings us uh, to uh, the point where if you had questions about any of those things, I'd certainly take those. Um, and then your options this evening are you could recommend approval of the original ordinance you could recommend approval with edits, which is what we've gone through this evening, the PNZ recommended edits, or you could simply recommend denial of um, any particular part of this, which would keep the existing code the way that it is. That's what I had for you. If you had additional questions, um, I'd be happy to take those. And then I think it's appropriate to uh, um, get into your public hearing. And Darren, for a point of clarification, we have two action items on that. We have two separate ordinances. Thank you, under a single application uh, number, that's, where, but yes, thank you, Fonda, that's correct. Darren, I had one question about the change or the elimination of the definition of tourist homes, um, presumably replacing that with short-term rental. Is there anywhere else in our code where we need to revisit um, that term where it might appear uh, with as pertains to the collection of our occupancy tax here. I know that's a concern I've heard from some citizens changing um, the language and code. We wanna make sure we're collecting that very important occupancy tax from all tourist homes and short-term rentals. Is there, I, I don't know if this is within your um, realm, but can you just talk to that really quickly? Cause I've had some people express concern about that. I can, Mr. Chairman, and, and the language um, within the uh, short-term rental ordinance is an and. So again, it would be a belt and suspenders situation um, where we collect it for short-term rentals and tourist homes. And so if there were an instance elsewhere in the code um, that we may have missed where it calls it a, a tourist home, it would still be collected. The bed tax would still be required and collected um, as it is now. 
So all owners of what are currently described as tourist homes are, as of the adoption of this code, owners of short-term rentals, is that correct? Therefore, they're subject to the same tax requirements? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on part two before we open the reopen the public hearing? Okay. Uh, I move that we now reopen the public hearing to address the amended proposed ordinance and part two of the proposed amendments. Would anybody like to make that motion? So move. I so move. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. We will now prepare to proceed with the public hearing. Please note that the public hearing is for comments only. Do not address any questions to the commissioners or to city staff. If commissioners have questions for the person testifying, they should ask those questions at the time of their testimony. For those in attendance here in chambers this evening, if you would like to speak, you will need to complete a sign-up form available on the table by the door and hand it to the clerk. Do not approach the dais. If you have any written materials for the commissioners, please hand those to the clerk. For those participating on Zoom, please note that you will need a working microphone on your phone or computer to speak. When your name is called, you will see a prompt on your screen asking whether you would like to unmute, then you will need to unmute yourself in order to be heard. Each speaker will have three minutes. The public hearing is now open. Um, I'm going to start with our city residents who requested to speak before the meeting. Um, first, I'm gonna read a comment from somebody who does not wish to speak. Uh, this is from city resident Judy York. Uh, she says, please consider planning for affordable housing instead of Sand Creek development. I think we all agree that that's an important thing we should be planning for as well. Um, we have three city residents who would like to speak. So we'll start with uh, Pam Duquette. Would you please come up to the front of the room? I'm gonna read. So you stay on point. And I don't mind saying that this is my very first um, presentation of issue ever. Um, my name is Pam Duquette. I reside at 828 Lake Street. Um, I have lived in Bonner County for over 40 years and have witnessed much change. I'm a recently retired teacher and was luckily able to purchase a home in Sandpoint seven years ago. I'm only giving you a background to show um, the reason I have care for this. Before I began teaching, I was a self-employed tree planter and forestry worker throughout Bonner and Boundary County. I also managed to fit 20 years of employment at Schweitzer Mountain. I'm here tonight to share my concern of the detrimental effect of the overdevelopment that I feel has been happening in the county and in Sandpoint. I worry about our green spaces, forests, and waterways. I enjoy hiking, backpacking, skiing, and kayaking. I live here because I love what nature has given us. I'm a volunteer for Lake Pondere Waterkeepers and a supporter of Rock Creek Alliance, Friends of Scotchman Peaks, the ICL, to name a few. This I do to help protect what I have. Tonight, I just wanted to share my opposition to any overdevelopment along Sand Creek that just seems to end up happening. Um, we start with development and it ends up being overdeveloped. I oppose any change in the development and shrinkage of any existing and future vegetative buffers along this creek and all waterways. I was under the impression that we already had an established ordinance with setbacks and a comprehensive plan to preserve these areas. My wish would be that we adhere to that. I thought I would be a little more clear after coming today. I'm not on the language, but um, my opinion is just to keep what we have going and try not to overdevelop all the waterways and keep that 25 foot buffer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pam. Are there any questions for Pam? Okay. Um, next up is George Rickard, city, uh, city resident. George, would you like to come up? Thanks. Hey, I'd like to know, how does this ordinance make Sandpoint a better place to live? Not for developers, not for bankers, not for landowners, but how does it make Sandpoint residents' lives better? 
Um, I've lived in North Idaho for over 40 years. I've lived in Sandpoint for over 35 years. I'm against the urbanization of Sand Creek by removing the vegetable vegetative buffer. Removing the buffer would give a green light to developers that care more about making money than protecting the natural resources and providing good living wage jobs for Sandpoint residents. Yes, Sandpoint is a beautiful town. Many, many, many people would love to live here. Let's grow Sandpoint, but in a way that makes its citizens stronger, not succumbing to the influences of greed and money, but what's best for its citizens. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you. And next Sandpoint resident is Patty Shook. Patty, come on up. I have nothing really else to add. Those guys said it wonderfully. Um, I'm here to speak for all my friends and family that hate what's happening here. Um, we hate the idea of 25 feet from Sand Creek. Sure, it's okay maybe for the farm and landing, but I fear that it's gonna go clear down to Popsicle Bridge and we'll lose all the, all the vegetation again like they were saying, um, it just makes me sick because I ride that bike trail all the time and it, I get such peace and joy from looking around and enjoying the quiet, beautiful, um, natural bike trail. I, I just don't want to lose that. I fear, um, I, I just beg you not to ruin our beautiful creek in order to line further line the pockets of developers. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Mm -hmm. Are there any other city residents who would like to speak? Okay, we have two county residents, I believe. Mr. Not, Chairman? Yes. Oh, um, sorry, Zoom participants. I believe there's a Zoom participant uh, city resident, just one moment. Okay. Please introduce yourself once, you're, once you've joined us. Hi, um, I'm Marian O'Reilly. I live on St. Clair and I, agree with what the others said, but my comments are, are less significant tonight. First, um, E, you've got a couple of adjectives, um, water dependent. And so those appear and can be construed to affect all the nouns that come after. So why don't you go structures and water dependent functional uses. Put structures first, and then it will be clear that those adjectives don't apply to the structures, if, if that's your goal. And the new definition of building talks about occupancy. Is that human occupancy or storage of stuff? Or now we've got a bike shop that you know extends its warehouse back there, but is that occupancy? So I would encourage you to look at that and make sure we understand what occupancy is and whether that really applies to the goal. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Anybody else on Zoom, Melissa? If anyone else who's on Zoom um, would like to speak, please raise your hand. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay, go ahead. The um, label on this is Wild Idaho Rising Tide. So whoever this is will need to introduce themselves. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is Helen Yost of Wild Idaho Rising Tide. And I'm speaking both on behalf of myself as well as the organization and its 3,200 members, friends, and supporters. We are very concerned about changes, elimination of the 25 foot setback uh, we would like to see Sand Creek stay in its most natural state. Uh, it seems the ordinance changes in front of you now uh, need a little more uh, changes to comply with some of the questions asked by the commissioners tonight, uh, as well as the concerns of uh, both city and county residents about overdevelopment of Sand Creek. Uh, we would also like to note uh, that the first instance of any kind of 
recent development in the Sand Creek Corridor, all, albeit a dem, uh, demolition project of uh, the Arlo's building was a disaster. We have, and we will release soon photos of um, oil sheens streaming into the creek, massive sawdust, uh, even these elements showing up in the water downstream from the demolition at the, uh, at the launch site behind the Panada. Um, we just really believe that these changes in city ordinances are gonna open up uh, Sand Creek to overdevelopment into the water uh, and that there won't be enough regulation by the city, by the state, uh, by the county and by the federal agencies, much less monitoring of uh, these situations where Sand Creek uh, gets polluted by either construction or destruction, although we oftentimes consider it the same. Um, and that Sand Creek will therefore be polluted. We, we do commend the commissioners for asking so many questions and asking for changes. Uh, we would also like to see uh, some kind of storm water system put in place, however that happens. Um, and we're also concerned that not only commercial developers, but also large industries, such as the railroad, uh, will have more leverage to do more damages to our water bodies uh, with these changes in this code. Um, we've also documented two years of damages inflicted on our water bodies and air by uh, BNSF Railway and its Sandpoint Junction Connector project that we intend to make also public. Uh, and we also want to note that uh, any kind of parks construction in the Sandpoint core area seems to us like putting lipstick on a pig, where as the uh, U.S. Highway 95 and the BNSF Railway corridor and its expansion are already essentially an industrial corridor through this town. And more commercial development added to that, whether it's parks or whether it's commercial buildings, is just going to add to that over-industrialization and impact the health of residents. Uh, the railroad already spews carcinogenic diesel emissions into the air. And of course there's coal dust going into the water from uh, their operations. So we don't wanna see any more development in the Sand Creek and Lakeside area of downtown uh, just because it does. I have to cut you off there. Sorry, we really appreciate those comments. Uh, you were a little bit beyond the three minutes and we have to uh, make time for other commenters. But thank, you, thank you very much for those comments. They're very much heard. Are there any other Zoom participants who would like to comment? Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. O'Reilly has raised her hand again. She did speak for approximately a minute and a half. Uh, like to allow her to speak again? Uh, I think we could allow her another minute and a half. Somebody who might have their microphone on, if you could mute if you're at home. Maybe John, I think you're yeah. microphone. No? Okay. That's better. Okay, Miss O'Reilly. Uh, I didn't think I had raised my hand again. Thank oh. you for calling on me. But please do go back and address those two things I brought up when you get there. Thanks so much. Thank you. Anybody else on Zoom, clerk? No, Mr. Chairman. Okay, we have a couple uh, non-city residents who would like to speak tonight. I'll ask um, Rebecca Holland to come up first, please. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rebecca Holland. I'm a Bonner County resident, 46 years. I was a member of the B uh, Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee for eight and chaired that for five. I'm a business, Sandpoint business owner for 32 years and just recently joined the force of baby boomer retirees. <laughs> so my most concerned is about the city property along Sand Creek. I understand that private property um, rights and what people are gonna be doing with docks, et cetera, is um, not as concerning to me. Um, the concept to me of genuinely improving filtration of stormwater um, flowing into Sand Creek, I feel goes out the door with um, these proposed changes, the setbacks and striking the vegetative um, buffer. Uh, what can be seen in these changes 
is it points straight to overdevelopment disguised as recreation. Sandpoint already has a long multi-use path on its east shoreline. On the west side, there's a nice boardwalk that runs the equivalent of three blocks with ADA access on both ends and concrete stairway in the center at Bridge Street. What's missing is a safe bike route path to allow our residents and in particular our grade school kids. Access to this area and down to the two waterfront trails and to the city beach. Biking is a healthy recreation. Generally, sitting on an upper deck over a plaza, spending money to enrich out of town investors, looking at the water, in my opinion, is not. One of the additions that is being added to this code is that all new buildings within this downtown area should orient to, to Sand Creek and a lengthy list of structures, including plazas, walkways, stairways, art features, et cetera, et cetera, quote, may be constructed before the applicable high water mark. Um, no, please don't approve that. <laughs> um, as we well know, um, the comprehensive plan is the guiding light to follow here. Nowhere is there written policy for this. Whereas the comp plan clearly states, excuse me, uh, quote, make downtown a primary multimodal friendly destination. That's it, say it again. Make downtown a primary multimodal friendly destination. That's all of downtown. That means planners designed to walkers and cyclists needs. Let's keep it simple. Put our money toward improvements for established residents and their children here in our community. Um, few of us want to see excessive tricked out features, plazas, bandstands that drive our property values beyond our ability to pay the increased tax burden. Um, thank you for considering what I'm saying here and I'm happy um, to answer any questions you may have regarding the, the development along Sand Creek in particular with the 2013 adoption of the bike routes um, that city council adopted. And I feel like- Rebecca, we do have to stop you there. I'm sorry, I'm getting the eagle eye. You always get the eagle eye. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, and, no uh, questions? And, and I think we, we are all familiar with the uh, route to the, the bike route that you referred to. We've, I think you, last time you That's talked a little bit- That's been eliminated. About yes. Yes, yeah. there's no answer there. Yeah. I got it. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And next we have Steve Holt. Yeah, thank you. I'm Steve Holt with the Lake Ponderay Waterkeeper, and uh, <clears throat> I want to thank the commission and staff for for putting time in. I think it's a you know it's an incredibly complicated issue, and it has broad implications. As you know, the the current commercial zone goes all the way north of Cedar Street Bridge, all the way up beyond the Highway uh, 95 bridge, and you know, we've been assured that stormwater uh, is an important component of any language that we redraft. And I just, so I just wanted to take like maybe one little instance, uh, like let's just say the plaza, similar to the one that went in, you know, just below Spud. So right now, um, I took a plaza of less than 2,000 square feet because that number is critical further down. So essentially, we're talking about uh, pervious surface. 25 feet by almost 80 feet would be allowed in this. And so right now we have two methods for controlling stormwater uh, and stormwater quality with that. We have a conditional use permit and we have reference to the stormwater ordinance. So on the conditional use permit, the conditional use permit basically sets a set of development standards that the commission can go by and sort of come up with a checklist. And if you review the code, you'll see there's, they're quite extensive. And they're extensive for single family residential, residential multifamily, rural residential, residential substandard original lots of record, and a few other categories, but nowhere in the development standards is there a standard for a commercial zone. So you're almost in some ways stuck by granting a conditional use permit, which I actually suggested in my previous letter, so correct me if I'm wrong, I think you're gonna have a hard time um, with that one. Um, I did find a development standard under the residential 
code under riparian and shoreline setback. And it, and it struck me because the last sentence of uh, 6A uh, states that the city owned property shall not be, shall be exempt from the required standards. And I thought that's what this whole thing was about. We're all about trying to figure out how to do farmers landing, but we're putting language that's giving us a broad stroke. So then on the stormwater ordinance, I read it thoroughly. It's a very comprehensive and complicated document to follow. And in there, the only place I could find that we had any possibility to uh, have any enhancement or incentive for stormwater was uh, section 11-3-3 item E, which says that runoff from sites shall be discharged into an approved BPM, except in the following cases. So this is actually an exception. And it says when the total impervious surface on a lot uh, resulting from new construction or in addition to an existing structures is less than 2000 square feet, mm -hmm. runoff may be discharged directly into the existing storm water conveyance system provided that the existing facilities have sufficient capacity to accommodate the increased runoff. So that basically just says that all of the storm water, as long as it could get into the creek through a conveyance is fine. Mm. And so for us, this just is not trying to enhance water quality. We need to incentivize developers. Steve, I gotta stop you. We to do the right thing. And I hope that the commission, I really think that the commission should hold a series of workshops on this. I think that the city could find a way to do its project without having to put a blanket on the entire creek. Thank, Thank you. you. That was a concern that I had as well, reading the stormwater ordinance. I read it one end to the other in preparation for this. And it really didn't seem to apply to development right along a waterway like Santa Creek. It, it really seemed to apply to the kinds of developments we see you know, in the, in the middle of Sandpoint subdivisions and housing developments. Uh, so it did appear that it would be a little too easy to just drain water off of a impervious surface directly into the creek. And if that's the standard we hold developers to, uh, I have some concerns about that. So that, are there any other uh, members of the public on Zoom or in the chambers who would like to speak, Melissa? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman. Would anybody else in the chambers like to speak before we move on to deliberation? Okay. Uh, the public hearing is now closed. At this time, the commission will first deliberate and make recommendations on part one of the proposed amendments, followed by a separate deliberation and a recommendation on part two. At this time, questions may be directed to city staff only. And let's open this deliberation up. So uh, part one, we're discussing the proposed amendment regarding Sand Creek setbacks. Uh, I have a question for... Uh... Darren Fluke. Um, Darren, did I understand you to say that the new language is more restrictive than the existing language with respect, or, with respect to structures within the setback? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, that is what I said. Um, right now, the ordinance allows for an encroachment into the 25 foot setback. Um, by 15 feet for a deck or pervious structure. I, I would also note in this, um, because this just seems a natural place for you, that um, if you're hearing an item on conditional use, certainly, um, especially for something like flat work um, within that 25 feet, you could certainly require that the paving be pervious. Or, um, that would be well within your purview. I think one, I would take exception with one part of that statement, Darren, that it's, it's uh, our current code is more restrictive in that our current code also requires a vegetative setback. So presumably a, a pervious deck built 15 feet, or I should say 15 feet into the setback. So 10 feet setback from the, the creek, uh, you know, assuming that there was a, a vegetative setback, we, we are still maintaining that vegetative setback. There's no longer a requirement that the 25 foot setback be vegetative. Um, 
and we could see impervious structures all the way to the creek with, as we've discussed extensively, the relatively easy to obtain conditional use permit. Of course, I understand that the conditions can be determined at the time of the application, and it's it's uh, it, 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 what as you just pointed out, a condition could be that structures are uh, pervious. Now that I wonder if that should be codified. Should we put that in code that all structures? eligible for a CUP must be pervious structures. Now I know that severely limits what those structures might include in terms of a, you know, a potential condominium development that wants to put private decks overlooking the, the creek or something. But if, if really water filtration is our primary, water treatment is our primary concern in water quality, um, it seems <clears throat> like if we want the new code to be as uh, protective of water quality as existing code, we should include the vegetative setback, not just a any 25 foot setback and the, the words pervious in terms of any structures that can be built. I know that when you get out into the creek, you're not going to have a, a pervious dock for boats. Um, so maybe uh, f um, what was the, the language again about um, water uses? If you don't mind reminding me, the functionally dependent water uses, um, maybe something like a dock could be impervious, but all other structures must be pervious. Mr. Chairman, um, respectfully, I, I think we're getting a little far afield here. Um, first, with regard to the comment about decks, note that those are part of the building and must maintain the 25 foot setback. We didn't make a big deal of this, but you know, the, the existing code says vegetative setback, and that's all it says. It doesn't define vegetative setback. And if you look down at the area where we're concerned about trying to build a stormwater structure that gets better treatment, you don't have much of a vegetative setback there. I mean, you've got all, all manner of things. And so it's never been defined and never been required what vegetative means. And so we don't really have a way of enforcing um, you know, what a best management practice would be. And then I would just want to make this point that the existing ordinance, the way that it's written, basically says that a 25-foot vegetative setback is the end-all beat-all for stormwater management. That's all we can do the way the ordinance is written right now. We couldn't do any other sort of subsurface treatment um, as we went through at the last um, meeting and showed you those various different concepts for um, how to treat stormwater. Those are all not allowed. Basically, the ordinance says vegetative buffer and that's it. So I think Dan could speak um, to how the existing um, stormwater ordinance would apply to a new project coming in and doing work, but know that a structure would have to be set back 25 feet. Could we ask Dan uh, briefly, since you're here in the chambers, uh, Steve talked about the exemption for structures or any developments under 2000 square feet uh, being allowed for such smaller structures to uh, convey stormwater directly into existing <laughs> stormwater treatment or conveyance. Is that, is that a realistic possibility here that under current stormwater ordinance code, any structure under 2000 square feet would have, it would, we could not require them to do any additional stormwater treatment. Yeah, I think uh, this section of code um, could be misinterpreted to read that uh, a building expansion of less than 2000 feet. This is specific to the total, uh, I can read it. When the total impervious surface on a lot resulting from new construction or in addition to existing structures is less than 2000. So there cannot be anything else on that lot in total impervious uh, amounting to more than 2000 square feet for this exception to apply. So if there's an existing house and then you're building a concrete patio, if you're over 2000 square feet total, including the house, this exception doesn't apply. I see. So, um, so that wouldn't, so a 2000 square foot patio added onto an existing building along First Avenue <laughs> would be well over the 2000 square feet. Therefore, they would be required to what? 
they cannot then just convey stormwater directly into Sand Creek, what would they be required to do? They would need to comply with this code, which requires you to treat the first half or retain the first half inch of water, reduce the uh, peak flow from the 25 year event. So it's basically full conformance with this code at that point. So, and there's any number of different treatment techniques, the grassy swales, you know, other sort of structures. Uh, uh, we were shown by our new parks planner a couple of weeks ago, some really um, impressive photographs of uh, subsurface stormwater treatment that's been incorporated into public and I assume private developments along waterways. Um, for me personally, that's what I understand the city wants to do on Farman's Landing, but this, proposed ordinance amendment will affect um i i look i used a, a measurement tool today there's over a there's over a thousand uh yards of commercial waterfront up to the end of commercial a and then there's another uh vast expanse of commercial waterfront north of that little slice of uh, residential there along sand creek so um i have the utmost confidence that the city will invest in the most high-tech stormwater treatment facility at Farms Landing. But if we adopt this code and then we start seeing uh, retaining walls built for a thousand yards, you know, north and south of Farms Landing, what's to guarantee that we have similarly advanced stormwater treatment um, along the entire length of the creek? Yeah, there's no requirement to have the similarly advanced. There's a requirement to conform with code, which requires you to, to detain and, and treat uh, stormwater from impervious surfaces. So they would have to do that uplands location and you know, stuff to speculate what a development might look like, look like and what uh, stormwater treatment techniques or technologies might be available given site conditions. Uh, it's just hard to do that. Okay. without a development plan in front of you, but yeah. that would be the responsibility of the developer to conform with this code. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions for staff from commissioners? I have a question. Uh, that would be um, when we were looking at making this change, uh, why was it deemed that it should be for the entire I think it's just commercial A and B, correct? There is no C in this area we're talking about? It applies to C as well, but C, there's no frontage along Sand Creek for C. Okay, it's so it would apply to all, but there's A and B. Because um, I guess why were we looking for this kind of a code change for the entire commercial zone instead of just what is delineated as the downtown commercial zone, where when we look at what's existing there now, there's an enormous amount of pavement, and this would be an excellent opportunity to enhance water quality when development takes down there, uh, takes place down there uh, by mitigating for that pavement or eliminating that pavement. So I guess I'm curious, what, um, but then when you look north, when you look north, there's a beautiful vegetative buffer going north of uh, Cedar Street Bridge. So I'm curious as to why we were looking at changing everything instead of just the downtown delineation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, that, that's again a bit of a quirk of the uh, Sandpoint City Code and the way the, um, the way the commercial zones are written together within the code. Um, hopefully you're seeing the, the GIS screen here. Are we seeing that okay? Yep. Yeah. So essentially, um, you, you know, when, <laughs> when we look at the, the downtown portion of code from the, uh, the byway bridge here, um, going north, you've got the existing marina built. You've got urban type development um, here at the Bridge Street um, location and the Cedar Street location here. And this is the, the portion of the city that is uh, covered by the uh, um, Parks and Recreation Master Plan, as far as the plaza area was designed or conceptually designed for this location right in here. Um, when you look at the, the rest of the city along the Sand Creek waterfront, literally the only areas in question um, beyond that is this stretch here, just north of the Cedar Street Bridge. Then you've got residential um, zoning here. 
And then you have your commercial B zoning here, which applies to these um, private properties. And then north of that, while you've got commercial B zoning along the creek, none of that is developable. This parcel is owned by the city of Sandpoint. Um, and these are not parcels, you know, they're in government control and, and will not see development. And so, you know, it, it's not that this ordinance applies to a wide swath of the city. It's pretty well restricted um, to the waterfront. And the reason that we made it applicable to all the commercial zones is because that is the way the commercial um, zoning standards are written in the existing code. And without doing a much larger overhaul, um, we felt this um, achieved the objectives with the least amount of harm, if you will. Other comments or questions from I have some questions uh, again for uh, Darren. Uh, several of the speakers talked about it's kind of the natural look or the, the green frontage along the creek uh, that is a result of the 25 foot vegetative setback. And uh, so, and my understanding is that um, under current code, if, if I own the land on Sand Creek, I could uh, build uh, whatever buildings are allowed in that area uh, under commercial A zoning. Uh, would have to respect that 25 foot setback. So no matter what I built there, my entire building, including any decks, would have to be behind a 25 foot vegetative buffer. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, that's correct. Anything part of the building would um, be required to maintain that 25 foot setback. Okay. And then under the changes we're considering, I could, instead of having a vegetative buffer, I'd still have to have that setback for my building. Uh, but if I wanted to, instead of having a vegetative buffer, I could have some kind of plaza for my tenants that would have some sort of water treatment incorporated in its design. So we would meet the requirements of maintaining the quality of the creek water, but not, uh, we would not meet, not requirements. We, we would not in that case meet the goal of public access. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, that, that would be subject to a conditional use permit. And so you, you all would hear that application for whatever that structure was. If it was anything being built, proposed to be built within the 25, foot um, setback, then you adhere and condition that application appropriately. Okay, um, but there's a limit on the conditions we could provide. I'm just, I'm trying to, to, I'm trying to envision what Sand Creek might look like if everybody who could built a commercial or mixed use buildings along the creek and decided to have some allowed sort of stormwater treatment system other than a vegetative buffer, uh, how, how that would affect that, that green look that folks uh, talked about liking. And then the map you just showed us, it didn't appear that a whole lot of that green buffer would disappear anyway, because it seems like there's a very limited amount of land that is available for that kind of development. Is that correct? Um, let me share the map again, Commissioner. And uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we may be um, getting beyond my uh, ability to answer that question. And I might ask one of my colleagues uh, there in the room to hop in. Um, Commissioner, is, the land is largely developed <laughs> along along the creek. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not a, a pristine riparian environment by, by any stretch. You can see you've got, you know, docks in this upper stretch, hospital facility up here. Um, and um, so I think there, you know, there are limited opportunities for redevelopment 
um, at this point. Now I, yeah, so the hospital owns that parcel. I'm just trying to see who, who owns what up around here. Um, then we're into the residential zone there. I think this is, yeah, a medical building. And they don't have much water frontage anyway, as you can see there. So then we're in a residential zoning. These areas are largely developed and with, you know, then they've got their functionally dependent water uses down here already. And then we get into um, properties that are not essentially not developable. Okay. Even though they're zoned commercial. So that gold is all, it's either not developable or it, it's not, it's residential anyway. Is that what you're saying? I, that's more or less what I'm saying. I mean, there are instances, I mean, these, these properties along Larch Street here, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's possible that they would experience redevelopment and you've got some commercial property here that's a gas station, I believe. Um, but a very uh, steep slope above the, I think almost vertical, if I'm not mistaken, in this location mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. creek. So again, you know, limited opportunities for um, getting at the water, um, regardless of what the um, what the setback or zoning is. Okay, uh, and then I just uh, I wanted to revisit that language that Miss O'Reilly uh, mentioned. Uh, this was maybe in the editor and me speaking and, and uh, Molly brought that out. But yeah, that adjectival, adjectival phrase, functionally dependent, when it comes before the term structure, it can be used to limit the definition of the, the term structure. And she suggested that the word structure go after functionally dependent Functionally, uh, she uh, start the sentence with the word structures and then have it read structures and functionally dependent water systems. What were they? <laughs> anyway, if we put the word structures at the beginning of the sentence, then we don't risk getting it confused uh, uh, with functionally dependent. Uh, what are they? Water uses. Thank you. Uh, so I think that is a good suggestion, and I would like to uh, I would like to move that word structures to the beginning of that sentence. Um, and then the other thing she asked us to look at again was the term occupancy. I'm sorry, um, I don't remember where that is used here. Do you? Can that's the you... definition of buildings in part in part two. That's actually the the part two of what we're we're not deliberating on part two yet. Oh, okay. So we're not, we're Sorry. Not Let's go back to that later. Then, thank you. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, um, I think that's a sensible change and easy enough to make, as I just showed here on the slide. If you're seeing that, um, I think that clarifies it a little more as well. Um, I. I <laughs> I, I'm, I go back and forth between whether we want to be broad or whether we want to be very specific in the language here. Um, so, but I'm actually going to put that on hold for a minute. Um, I, I just like to, this is deliberation, not so much a question, um, a, a thought. I, I kind of wonder how we, how we ended up here. Um, in 2019, the, the city adopted a parks master plan that had widespread support we know we had public workshops. I participated in many of those public workshops and I was wooed by the vision for Farman's Landing and the, the public infrastructure that could go in there. Um, I think even our water keeper, even the, those who are passionate about water quality agree that investment in stormwater treatment at Farman's Landing is, is a good idea and that we've, we've been shown amazing pictures of, of what that could look like. Um, but now here we are asking, being asked to adopt a code amendment that would affect not just the, I don't have my uh, measurement here, but it's probably 60 yards, 50 yards of Farman's Landing, but over a thousand yards of, of waterfront continuing far to the north. Um, I just have a hard time believing it's not possible for us to go ahead with our parks master plan vision without uh, adopting an amendment that could stand to transform a waterfront over the next 50 to 100 years in a way that I've heard overwhelming 
objection to from the public. And I've talked to way more than the people in this room tonight. Um, I would like to thank uh, Steve for not just his comments tonight, but he wrote us a six page letter that went into some great details on this. But I've spoken to, I've reached out and spoken to business owners along between Bridge Street and, and, and uh, Cedar Street and asked their thoughts. And you think that business owners would be the ones most excited about this, this type of development um, or this type of amendment to allow for greater development. But I think they also realize that it might mean that the future is not for them if, if the kind of development that this could attract actually comes to Sandpoint. So I would urge staff and legal um, to consider language that allows the city to go forward with the development of Farmers Landing, the stormwater improvement investments that are planned for there, but you know, either keeps the language as it is, because I, I, I think we have heard overwhelming support for not changing things in a way that invites the kind of development that will uh, transform our waterfront in a, in, a, in a manner that isn't, that doesn't put uh, people who live here first, but, but you know, attracts uh, the kind of development that I've heard overwhelming objection to. So I, I understand uh, we've heard from Fonda many times about the potential for a takings claim. Your responsibility Am I, for your balance. That's what I keep talking I, about. I understand that as well. Um, we have setbacks of 40 feet around the 110 mile shoreline of, of Lake Ponderé uh, in, in the county. I have a setback on all sides of my property um, that prohibit me from building uh, structures of any sort too close to my property lines. So I, I think maintaining a setback and enforcing it and protecting water quality, but also just as importantly, protecting the, the vision that I hear from members of our community for our downtown. Um, that, so I, I just, it frustrates me that we're being asked to uh, adopt an amendment that stands to transform a thousand yards of waterfront and more when all we really have overwhelming support for based on the, the public hearing or the public process that was undertaken in 2018, and 2019 with our parks plan is for about a 50 yard stretch of the waterfront that uh, was purchased by the city in 2016 for the express purpose of improving stormwater treatment and protecting water quality. So that, that's just something I'm gonna put out there for consideration hmm. by the commission. Jason, can I add a, a a comment or two. Sure. I, I think Jason has encapsulated well the, the thoughts that I've been having that the principal uh, driving, driving factors that I've heard that seem to ne necessitate some amendment to the code have been that there are currently city owned or other public uh, facilities currently constructed or constructed probably in violation of the of our existing code and that of course needs to be remedied one way or another and then the planned facilities at farm and landing I don't understand why we wouldn't be doing an ordinance that simply addresses those issues and not be opening it up as Jason has pointed out, to a long stretch of waterfront, to a whole variety of structures that we don't even know what they might be. I would like to see a much more narrowly uh, drafted ordinance. I, I have a question. Um, is there any portion of the east side of Sand Creek that is in any way significantly impacted by this change. I know all of our focus has been on the west side. Is there enough land on the east side that this is even a thing over there? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, again, I'll defer to my colleagues in the room, but I believe the short answer is no, um, that there is not privately owned property on that side that's subject to development um, regardless of that um, zoning on. Uh, is that all right of way? Is that all predominantly right of way? That's my understanding. Okay. I, I would point out the uh, one publicly owned property that could be developed, um, assuming this the adoption of this. And again, this was part of the park's uh, vision 
in the 2019 parks plan is the site, the potential site of the carousel, which we're zooming in on right there. So the, the presumably the structure that would hold a future carousel or whatever we decide to do with that site. I've heard um, concessions for kayak or stand up paddleboard rentals. Those things would not be permitted under, under current code. But again, um, we, I feel like there's a, there's gotta be a way we can, we can carve out ex, ex, exceptions for public infrastructure, like a carousel or the, uh, the park at Farman's Landing without transforming 50 years from now, the entire Sand Creek waterfront. So that uh, we, we've heard several suggestions uh, again. I mean, this is substantial. This is a huge change we're talking about. And I'm not thinking about you know, the next five years, I'm thinking about the next 50 years and, and Bonner General's there now, they're gonna be there for a while, but who knows if Bonner General is gonna be there in 50 years and what developer might come in and develop the property north of, of Cedar Street. So this is such a, a major change that I, I do um, wish there had been more attempt to involve the public through workshops. Um, I know public comment, of course, is, has been sought and, and received and it's overwhelmingly opposed to this. So that, that's kind of where I sit on this is there needs to be further outreach and involvement with the public unless we can adopt a simple amendment that allows for the public investments at Farman's Landing and the, the potential site of the carousel or the whatever concessions might go in across the creek from there. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think yes. it's time to call for a vote. Okay, I'm open to a motion. So, and Darren, can you put back? Up yeah, the there screen? are three options, I believe. So, we, if you could put those options back up, Darren, we could perhaps see what our choices are here. And this is in relationship to part A. Only. Part, yes, part one of the proposed amendments tonight. I do think there's uh, language. No, there's not language in our packet tonight. Um, Darren, you had a slide. I think it's yeah. slide 19 there. If you could put slide 19 up. There you go. Wanda, I have a question. <clears throat> Can we approve with uh, uh, a fall uh, with a change of that this only covers a certain area? There would be no way for you to make a motion to make that change in this. But couldn't the change because, be... because you guys aren't making the change of the decision. This is going to council. So what you're doing is making a recommendation. You're making a motion as to what you'd like to see done with the proposed ordinance as a recommendation to council. And are we making recommendations for both parts now, or do we do the two separately? We're doing them separately. So this is just part A. Okay. And so if you if you look at the screen, you can make a motion to recommend approval of the ordinance as originally drafted. So last meeting's ordinance. You can make a recommendation for approval of the ordinance with the edits that were made on screen tonight. So that was the reversal of the word structure moving it to the beginning of the sentence. Or you can make a motion to recommend denial and keeping the existing code that's in place. Does that help clarify? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess so, um, maybe not. So one of the um, issues with limiting the area, if you will, or wanting to define the area goes into what we talked about last time regarding our inability to spot zone. It, it, there's no way to do that on the fly in a public hearing tonight, first of all. And so second of all, and we, and we can't spot zone. I'm not saying there isn't an opportunity of council. If you recommend denial tonight and this goes to council and they send it back to staff for something different. I mean, we don't know what's gonna happen on tonight. You don't approve or deny what's proposed. You just make a recommendation to council. with with your commentary that you've already provided. Mm -hmm. I guess one of my hangups is <clears throat> there's a lot about this that I like and I do, I share some sentiments of some of the public comment and other commissioners. Um, uh, I'm a lifelong resident. So I, I've, seen the, I've seen the changes here. I've also spent my life working in the forest and I work around soils and water and 
uh, plant species and wildlife every single day. Um, I understand the importance of, um, you know, the qual water quality is a big deal and it's more and more that way every day. Uh, so I have empathy for that view 100%. But there's things in here that I really like as far as cleaning up the code language that that does not work for us right now in all the ways that we want it to. And <clears throat> other things like, uh, I feel like the city may be trying to overreach with some of this because uh, this is a, like, it, like it's been said a lot of times is belt and suspenders above what DEQ and FEMA and Idaho Department of Lands and and other agencies who have far more power than what we have to protect water quality. And I do agree that some of the stuff that's happened on the waterfront is, has gone against that. But I feel like this proposal takes at least a significant step in a good way to, to take care of that. Um, I don't believe it's all or it's perfect, but I believe <clears throat> it is a step in the right direction. I do like the farmer's landing idea. I do like the new and improved and, and uh, you know, cutting edge, I guess, ways to deal with um, wastewater treatment, which we're not doing now. And we have very little control over as far as I can tell. Um, and I also, as a human being, I feel like developers, are kind of getting a bad name because a lot of development I see has gone far beyond what is required by ordinance and code and um, you know standards to protect water quality because it is a bad thing to just come out and say, hey, we're just gonna, all we're worried about is money. Right now we're in a, in a global trend of, of protecting the environment bigger than just Sand Creek you know, air quality, um, so many things are, are, are in people's minds and it's not just residents of Sandpoint and it's not just developers and it's not just, you know, us sitting here. So I believe I would pass this as is with my, my input being, there is more to do. There's more to add to it later um, because, you know, this is an evolving thing. This should be a working document that, that can be, you know, like the points that have brought, been brought up, um, those are things that should be looked at and, um, you know, try to find a solution to those things. So that's my input. I think, um, yeah, I agree with Mo that there are aspects of this that provide a lot of improvements. Um, but I am concerned about giving up the vegetative buffer all the way along the creek. Um, and I wish there were some way we could do it just to enable the city to continue with its plans for Farman's Landing. Uh, and that leads me at this point to feel like I would recommend denial. motion is that a motion kate i move to recommend denial is that sufficient could i amend that motion briefly please well, you, have, you don't have a second on that yet i'll second the motion now you may make a motion to amend the motion. i would like to make a motion to amend kate's motion to recommend denial with the recommendation that city council calls for a public workshop on the language around this amendment. I think uh, the success of the Parks and Rec outreach, which included many, many public workshops, brought us the, the fantastic plans we have for the, the 60 or so yards of, of waterfront. And if we're going to adopt a sweeping amendment that allows for similar redevelopment of over a thousand yards of waterfront, we should have the public engaged in that language uh, as Would well. Would you repeat your motion? So my, my motion is to amend Kate's motion to deny with the recommendation the city council call for public workshops to, to workshop the language of this amendment. I would second that. 
Well, so will you take a roll? Doesn't Kate have to agree to that? I think we all, well, we're going to uh, <laughs> take a roll call vote. Roll here. call vote the motion to amend. Let's roll call vote the motion to amend. Commissioner Dunkel? Nay. Commissioner Walker? Aye. Commissioner Hastings? Aye. Commissioner Camp? Aye. Commissioner Shuck? Aye. Commissioner Riggs? Aye. Commissioner Heisman? Aye. So I think we've amended that motion. Now we need to vote whether or not to ad adopt that motion. So let's uh, have another. <laughs> so now you have a motion pending. Yes, we have a motion pending. To recommend. Denial of the current code amendment with the, with the recommendation the city council calls for public workshops. Now do you have a second on that motion? Do I have a second on that motion? Second. Yes, you do. I second. I have a second, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Roll call vote then. Commissioner Huseman? Aye. Commissioner Riggs? Aye. Commissioner Shuck? Aye. Commissioner Camp? Aye. Commissioner Hastings? Aye. Commissioner Walker? Aye. Commissioner Dunkel? Nay. Uh, the motion passes. Thank you. Okay, the uh, final um, item is the deliberation on part two of the amendments, which was the change in definitions plus the footnote that, what was the footnote? That in, uh, requires multifamily- Back to the design standards. Yes, cross-references back to the design standards for multifamily development in commercial zones. Is that correct? Okay. Um, I would entertain a motion to <clears throat> accept these amendments. Second. Okay, roll call vote. Motion to recommend approval. Rec sorry, motion to recommend approval of these amendments and changes so, in definitions. So moved. Okay. Second. Okay, roll call vote. Commissioner Riggs? Aye. Commissioner Hastings? Aye. Commissioner Walker? Aye. Commissioner Huseman? Aye. Commissioner Shuck? Aye. Commissioner Dunkel? Aye. Commissioner Camp? Aye. Okay, motion passes and uh, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>